It's not a matter of how fast, how far, or even where we run. Whether we run one mile or 100 miles, we are on a journey and embracing where it leads us. This is Running for Distance. All right, thank you for joining me on Running for Distance. I'm your host, Anthony Gilbert, and I have a guest with me today. He is a returning guest. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to people returning because when they got good stuff to talk about and they've got good stories and good experiences, why not? Because as we both, as we all know, um, no conversation is ever going to be exactly the same. And not everybody always listens to the first episode or the second episode. It's always an opportunity for new people to listen to stuff. My guest comes from the state of misery. I mean, the state of Missouri. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's one of my best friends. And um, we have traversed through a hundred miler together. He was my pacer in my first completed hundred miler. And then he went on and, and crushed his first hundred miler at Tunnel Hill and has hopes to doing that again in the future. Um, he is also the head basketball coach at Paulville, Paulsville. Um, home of the Indians and um, they had a really great season this last year and so I want to welcome my friend my brother Brandon Kreitz back to the program. Thanks for man okay. it's early hey I'm happy to be here. Absolutely so for those of you that are listening or joining in Brandon and I we got up really early this morning to be the one so that our schedules uh, would line up and as we both have experienced Things don't always go the way we want them to. And uh, as ultra runners, you learn to pivot and you learn to adjust and adapt. But also as Christians, you learn to adjust and to adapt. And, you know, it's, I don't want to necessarily say compromise, but it's, uh, you know, you you do the best that you can and, and you just deal with it. And of course, even as, as men and as husbands, right, our wives do stuff that we don't always want to do and it, it throws a, a wrench in our schedule and our plans and just kind of say yes dear <laughs> absolutely every day although sometimes i yes dear but uh, <laughs> let's make a deal yeah um brandon he's he's got a beautiful wife he's got three beautiful children that keep him hopping and that full of energy full of life and man and, you know, I've got four. Keep me going. <sighs> it's good. Brandon's got a lot going on. Brandon has a lot going on and has been going through a lot in the last year. And it's crazy, Brandon. I know we were we were texting this last week. And it's been a year since we had our last episode and, and released stuff. And I'm like, and like you said, man, the time flies. It doesn't even seem like it's been a year. But it has. And here to think that in a couple of a uh, couple months it's going to be two years since I ran a pumpkin, which kind of blows my mind because I'm like, time definitely flies. And last year, you know, Michelle and I talk, and it feels like COVID, even though it was crazy, and everyone staying at home and everyone's locked down, and the time flies. It's like you're at home, but the time just seems to just fly by and I'm like it's hard to believe that we start looking at pictures and stuff in the past I'm like man that was that was like three years ago and I was like yeah well last year was kind of a you hit the fast forward button and just it's kind of a I hate to say it, it wasn't a waste but you know you just lost so much opportunity in some areas but you gained so much opportunity in other areas and I know opportunity being at home, even for yourself, with Jamie and the kids. I mean, you had opportunities that you hadn't had in the past before. Same here. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we started. My wife just came. Just oh, came hi. home from her run. Yeah, everybody's meet my wife. She just got done. <laughs> she gets up. She gets up every day super early. How many miles? Um, what did you do today? Oh, I just did a few this morning. Just a few. She's up. Yeah, yeah just, just a few. Yeah, just three. Just three. Okay. Not like you guys. <laughs> yeah. And I like it just. She did just finish a 16 mile or mm -hmm. supposed to be 15 and a half. Someone is 
hit my Strava up right now. I keep getting these alerts. <laughs> um, she did, what was the name of the race? Uh, Trail of the... Trail of the Four Winds. Yeah. yeah. 16.5 right. miles. It's awesome stuff. Um, awesome stuff. You know, when people say, um, yeah, I just ran a few miles, that I laugh because I, I tell people, yeah, I just ran a few. And they're like, how many? And I was like, yeah, you know, half marathon, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Just a few. So yeah. you just did a warm up basically three miles. So. Yeah. Yeah. Time where three miles felt like a lot. But now if you say, like we were talking before, uh, about the the race that we talked about maybe doing together if it works yeah uh, so 30 that, um, i'm just gonna go ahead and um <laughs> so <laughs> brandon and i just kind of give some background for everybody brandon and i um have known each other for a year and a half and we met through just talking about uh I think it was, uh, you were telling me about Juice Plus when you were doing Juice Plus stuff. And I was, we were just having a conversation on Facebook one, one night. Um, didn't even know the guy. Um, it was one of those instances where, you know, you, you go in and you get, you know, Facebook uh, says, hey, you might, you might want to connect with this person because this person knows this person. And I started just going to adding people. Didn't know mm -hmm. you. Went ahead and added you and we just started talking and someone had mentioned something in one of the pages that we were in together. And I was like, yeah, I'll talk to this guy. and We'll see what, what he has to say. And we just start talking business stuff that it's like so awesome because um, who would have ever thought that we'd have such a great friendship through just a, a random conversation trying to uh, share a product with each other. And you're doing it with me, yeah. I was doing it with you. And <laughs> here we are a year and a half later. We've only met one time, Talk. which is crazy. Talking every yeah, a year was it, is it a year and a half? Feels like maybe. it was. A, it was a year. And a half. No, it's almost. Oh gosh, dude, it's almost been two and a half years. Yeah, see, COVID messed up our timeline. See, there's that whole year is gone. Yeah, it can't be a year and a half because we were we were well into conversations and building relationship. Um, leading up to pumpkin and like I yeah. said, pumpkin was um, in october will be two years so brent and i have only met one time and the crazy thing of it is that one time that we met was when he came to pace me and we met friday evening at the hotel and here we are we've never met each other and we roomed together and then the dude goes and paces me for you know 30 plus miles um and is my crew for my for my hundred. And man, it's just amazing to see what the Lord does with people. Because talk about huge trust to drive, you know, four or five hours over to meet somebody. Six hours. Yeah, six hours. Um, <laughs> spend your weekend with somebody that you've never met. But we your hotel room, six, six seven guys. guys. For all you know, I could have been some actor. <laughs> yeah. I knew better because Brennan and I hit it off, like I said, and you know, we talk almost almost every day. And it might just be, hey man, how's things going? And then there's times we have the deeper conversations. And but man, it's it's always like I feel, man, that like we've known each other for a lot longer than two years. Absolutely. And, We've been through a lot together, even without even being together. And so we share, man, we share everything. That's, and it's like, that's how it is with brothers in the Lord is accountability and, and sharing. And that's how you get through stuff. And I've got accountability and I've got trust built with Brandon. I can tell him anything. And I know that he's not going to, you know, you're not one of these guys that goes and airs it on social media for everyone to hear. It's, you know, it's confidential. And he shared stuff with me. And it's like, it, it's just an awesome relationship. And yeah, I consider him my brother. And I'd have to say you probably are my best friend because I talk to you more than anybody. <laughs> yeah, likewise, my friend. It's crazy. We are talking. So Brandon messages me the other night and uh, says, hey, bro, um, I'm going to be running this race. 
Actually, I, I want to see. I, I want to read it word for word exactly. So I, I get it. Right. Uh, I don't but, remember what I said. <laughs> um, oh crap! Where is it? Let me find your. Yeah, let's see. Here it is. Okay, so I know that you had listed a couple races that you were going to do. And that was one of the, the conversations we had in the past. And you listed all these races that you were planning on doing in 2021. Um, you said, hey, man, you want to do that 50K in Kansas with me in July? <laughs> and, slide it in. Yeah, just slide it in there. And um, it would be fun. Not very many runners. Only like 20 from last year. Extremely flat, I believe. <laughs> and so Brandon throws this at me and you know I had checked it out and you know for those of you that know and those of you that don't I'm from Kansas and it's uh it's in El Dorado and I grew up less than about well I grew up about 35 I think it's, I think Marion's 35 miles from El Dorado I don't know I used to drive through El Dorado all the time to go to work um, El Dorado is just outside of Wichita, for those of you that are thinking geographically. And um, El Dorado is a beautiful place. Um, it's where I ran my first trail half marathon at the, uh, oh, what did, what did they call it? Um, I don't know. Some people might think I'm swearing, but um, it's the damn hill. And that's what they often think is the damn hill. Well, it is a damn hill. Um, because it goes like this, <laughs> right. and it's the, uh, gosh, I can't remember the name of it. I just wore that shirt the other day. Um, but anyways, there's a lot, there is elevation there. There is some areas, but based on what we were just talking, the pictures, you know, it reminds me of Boonville up in Iowa. Um, reminds me of, uh, Heartland up there in Kansas and the Cassidy area. Rolling Hills, um, Kansas, you know, most people bring Kansas, they think Kansas is flat, like a pancake, and not in the Flint Hills. Um, the Flint Hills are not so much. Southwest Kansas, where I was born and raised as a youngster, yeah, you can see for 50 miles, I'm driving down the road, you can see stuff 50 miles away, like, like it's nobody's business, and it's like, it's stupid how flat it is out there is your head right to the foothills of the Rockies. But the flat hills, yeah, you got hills. That's why they call it hills, right? <laughs> but when they say relatively flat, I always uh, stop and I want to check stuff out because relatively, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen some race directors here in the area that say relatively, and then I go and look, and they said pumpkin was relatively flat. Right. Well, you and I both know Pumpkin was far from flat. For sure. Pumpkin had an elevation of, I think by the time I got done with my 100 of, uh, what was it, 7,500 or 8,000 feet of gain. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's that's about 2,000 feet of gain every 25 miles. And so that is, that's not flat. <laughs> was was a lot, there was a lot more hills than, than my 100 for sure. Yeah, and those big old rocks. You know, it wasn't like the fine rocks that are nice and easy to run on. It was like the big rocks. Yeah, yeah and those rocks just beat your feet up. And uh, so, yeah, Brandon asked me, hey, you want to run this? And I am considering it. Um, you know, here I am making making these decisions to, uh, I'm not going to run any more longer races. I don't really feel the desire to. I want to go and run a half marathon, and I want to get faster again and try to go after my PR. Man, I gotta be honest with you, bro. I was like, even though I still have speed, the body, I don't know. I almost think I would rather train for ultras at this point, man, because as we get older, you know, Brandon's younger than I am. Brandon's in his 30s still. <laughs> but uh, here I am pushing uh, next month, almost a month from today, I'll be 46. And not to say that's old, but the body just doesn't bounce back like it used to. But man, I've been... I've been seeing it's like those go when I go out and run those speed workouts, my body takes forever to recover. And people always, and I've always even said, man, I'd rather run a fast 
you know, half marathon and be done, then go out and run, you know, 50 miles or a hundred miles. The, the hundred milers we both know is a huge time commitment for training and everything else, but you're not going extremely fast now, unless you're Jim Walmsley or Camille Heron or, you know, one of these guys. Yeah. They run it fast because they're running a hundred miles faster than I would run a, a marathon pace. Right. Or even, I mean, I think the last thing that I looked at with Camille, you know, she was averaging like seven and a half minute miles. I'm like, dude, I don't even go out and run seven and a half minute miles right now. So I can't imagine doing that for a hundred miles, but training for a hundred. Yeah. It'll beat you up and you're tired. But you and I both just said we could go out and do a hundred today if we absolutely wanted to, because as we both know hundred milers and ultra marathons. It's not about the distance. It's about what's in, up here in your mental area. Cause it's mostly mental because the physical, we know the body is an amazing thing, but um, the mental aspect, you got to get over those mental hurdles in the dark places. And you saved my butt a few times at pumpkin um, when I was in dark places and just, Hey man, do you need anything? And you're just uplifting and, and inspiring and just being a brother and, and a friend. And you always knew what I needed. And just to help out, and yeah, I got in some dark spots. <laughs> yeah, almost thirty hours of no sleep, and goodness, it'll do it to you. Dude, I can't. I, and I here I am saying I was tired this morning when we got up to do this. No, <laughs> um, what we did was was sleep. I was sleep running, and um, I still remember. I think it was around the 70, 70 mile mark, something like that. 70, maybe 70, 72 miles. And man, I was just, I was hurting. I was falling asleep, slapping my face. <laughs> I was literally punching myself in the face to keep myself awake. And we stopped at the aid station and I got, I got some coffee because I was like, you know what? I haven't gotten sick except one time. I was like, I might as well just go ahead and see what happens because coffee is my friend in the mornings. And man, I got that coffee and it was like a jolt. And the sun came up, man, and I knew we were going to do this. And even though I was hurting, I had you with me. We both have the Lord. And as we know, um, one of my favorite lines um, of song is, though the, um, though the sorrow may last through the night, the joy comes in the morning. And I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. And it's like, you know, in that hundred miler, there's like darkness and then light. And that's just how it is in our walk is in life is we face the darkness. But if you know the light, you got nothing to worry about because Jesus saves, bro. Just like your shirt, just like your shirt shows is Jesus is the strength. And man, I, I'm thankful that I have the light in my life because I would be so lost in darkness without them. Absolutely. 100% with you, my man. So as I mentioned that, Brandon, how about you share, because, you know, this, this is our, our Men of Faith um, series. Of course, we still talk ultra running or whatever else pops up. But how about you share just a little bit about your testimony and how you came to know the Lord? Because, you know, I know you had you know, not necessarily the ideal childhood growing up, you know, and as we were just talking, you know, you've got some news that it's just basically it's, it's breaking news for you as of yesterday. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to share that without you sharing it first, because that's your news, but um, just a, a whole awesome thing of seeing how God brings things full circle. But how about you just share a little bit about your walk and how you came to know the Lord and, and how he has, um, transformed you as not only as a man and a husband and also as an ultra runner well um where do i begin you know i've always i've always um believed you know even growing up growing up uh my mom you know she she was a believer um yeah like you said growing up i didn't have the most ideal situation i grew up not knowing my earthly father um 
And, uh, you know, I, I lived with my mom until I was in eighth grade. We moved around a lot. And, uh, you know, I just remember when, uh, when I was younger and things weren't going right, you know, um, some of the guys in her life weren't always good to her. Um, some of them were very good to her, but whenever there were times where, um, there were situations that would give a young man, you know, anxiety, I would just pray. And, um, you know, so, so that was always kind of rooted in me. Um, just never had any doubt or question of, about my heavenly father. Um, you know, and like I said, I, I moved in with my aunt and uncle in eighth grade and, um, they were, they were Christians as well. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't go to church a lot. Um, it wasn't, it was it just, wasn't a thing that we did back then. Um, but my aunt and uncle raised me. They're like, uh, you know, second mother and, uh, you know, someone that kind of served, uh, kind of as like an earthly father would, even though I wasn't his own, he never treated me any different than his own kids. He has, uh, a son and a daughter, my uncle Kevin. Um, but my aunt Debbie and my uncle Kevin treated me like their own. And, uh, you know, uh, before I moved in with them, uh, while I was living with my mom, you know, there were some, there was, there were a lot of challenges, you know, without going into too much crazy detail, um, that led to me missing a lot of school, um, led to me, um, ultimately getting in a fight at school one day. The fight was over uh, a bully picking, picking with, picking on a friend. And, uh, I just stood up for him and, and, uh, I remember getting sent to the office over that where I met a man named George Rudisell, who was serving as the principal for the day. He wasn't the actual principal, um, our principal, uh, Mr. Mullaney, was out, and uh, George Rudisell was filling in. And uh, you know, he basically told me, "Hey, you know, you're in seventh grade, you're on the eighth grade basketball team, but you're not able to play because you're missing too much school. Um, you're now getting into fights, and uh, you're missing too much school. You have all this potential inside of you, and uh, you have a choice. You can go to." left or you can go right. And, uh, basically said, I believe you're going to make the right choice. You know, I believe in you. And, uh, that was the first person outside of my family that really spoke that life into me. And, um, that started a, a lifelong friendship with him. And, uh, the next year is when I moved in with my aunt and uncle and, uh, George was my math teacher that year. So the same guy that I met in the office and, and spoke some life into me and, um, he, he was my math teacher. So I got to see him every day. And, um, that relationship has continued to build. And so much so I remember being in eighth grade being being in school and it was the last day of eighth grade. And I remember just being sad that I wasn't going to have him with, with me every day, um, to be that encourager. Um, and just that, that friend, that adult friend and, um, mentor, I guess. In the last day of eighth grade, I remember just going up to his desk. He was my math teacher, and he would help me with my, my work. And I'd go up there, and I just remember getting getting kind of emotional, thinking that, you know, I'm not going to have him anymore. When I go to high school, he's going to be here. I'm not going to see him, you know. And that that really was feeling like a loss for me, um, just having that that man in my life that was uh, outside of my, my family. Um, and I, I just started to cry in his classroom. Um, so we went outside and I don't think he really until that point realized how much he meant to me. And, uh, we went outside and he gave me a big hug and, you know, I just sobbed, you know, while I'm giving him this hug and, you know, until that time, I don't think I realized, I realized, you know, what he meant to me. Um, but, uh, you know, going, going forward, uh, into high school, uh, he was the athletic director and, uh, it was, it was the actual next year, I think, that he went from being the eighth grade math teacher to the athletic director and just administrator. He did some other administrative things. So um, it's like God brought him with me, um, which was really, really special, you know, because I, even though I was living with my aunt and uncle, there were still challenges, you know, uh, me worrying about my mom and what was going on in her life. Um, 
and whenever I had hard days, I would go sit in his office. And, you know, a lot of days were just, we're talking about how the day is going. It was very, very positive. But whenever there was a hard day, I knew where to go. And uh, God brought him into my life. And, and I'm grateful for that. Um, he, he's a Christian. He was a, a, a previously uh, in ministry. And uh, he went to, uh, I forgot the name of the college, but it was a, it was a Bible college. And uh, yeah, just grateful for that relationship. And uh, moving forward, you know, I, I ended up, you know, showing up to class doing doing really well in school i felt like high school was a new beginning um when i moved in with my aunt and uncle i i didn't miss school anymore um my my grades improved dramatically i know my freshman year i finished with like a 3.9 gpa which was much improved from what i had in junior high and it was just because i i think i had less distractions at home um and uh, kind of like a firm family foundation and, uh, you know, that, that was when I really learned what a real family was like until that point, I had just seen more kind of chaos at home. And, uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, my uncle showed me what, a, how a real man treats his wife and, um, yeah, you know, and so that's kind of that. Then, you know, I ended up doing well in athletics also, uh, track and field and basketball and eventually went to play basketball in college and, um, always always had that connection though with my heavenly father that uh you know i never doubted so and that's awesome to it it reminded me um where where you met george um much like my daughter lex is you know one of her favorite teachers that she really looked up to in you know, junior high, she hated that she was not going to have her anymore. And then the next year when she went to high school, cause she was scared to go to high school, right? <clears throat> that teacher actually moved over to the high school and was her English teacher in the high school for her freshman and sophomore years. So it's like, you know, God laid the foundation for you, knew what you needed and you didn't have to face the fire alone. And it's so I mean, that conversation and that, um, that relationship could have went a lot of different directions, right? Because, and it's so important that we say things um, as teachers, as adults, words matter. I mean, you know, hold on, let me cough here a second. Hold on. Yeah. That's where I need my water now. The coffee's, <laughs> the coffee's gone and I don't have anything to drink. Um you know that we used to say as as a child, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And that you know, I used to think that was so true, but actually, that is a lie, because sticks and stones, yeah, they could break your bones and they can cause some physical harm, but words can words can cut deeper than you would ever even imagine. Because words, and it's even scriptural. Because I was like. You know, you, you as a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I'm like, what a lie from the devil, man, because we both know in, in the word, it says that the tongue has the ability to speak life or death. The power of the tongue speaks like or life or death. So I'm like, words will hurt you. Words can kill you, um, not not um, physically. But mentally and emotionally and spiritually, words cut deeper than a knife would. And what George said to you, he could have said a whole lot of different things to you, and it would have set the course for how you went. Here you are, a, let's just be honest, a punk kid, right? Because you know you're getting in fights and you know having having a hard home life. And he could have said a whole lot of different things, and it would have set things in motion to where you you could be in a, a really bad position or situation today to where you aren't, we're not having this conversation. We never met. You don't have a beautiful wife and your kids, but he chose to speak life into you and telling you he had, he saw the potential. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's important as, as parents and as administrators and as teachers and coaches to look for the potential in people because you had trouble. But that doesn't 
that doesn't define who we are. It didn't define who Brandon was. Brandon just had a hard situation, was in a hard situation um, at home. And oftentimes people don't want to get committed and know what's going on. But if you really knew, you know, in some of the classes and stuff I took in, in school, learning to communicate, the stuff on the surface is generally not what's really going on. It's the stuff below the surface. And unfortunately, so many people don't want to get involved because as we both know, is if you get involved in something that's deeper than what's on the surface, you're going to be committed. And that commitment takes time and energy. And a lot of people don't want to invest in that time and energy because it's, it becomes an inconvenience because you are in, let's just say it, you are inconvenienced when you have decided to mentor somebody or, um, just to do that type of stuff. Cause it's like, it, it will take, you know, just like ultra runners, you know, when you decide to um, train for a hundred miler or an ultra marathon, <clears throat> you're sacrificing time. You're sacrificing energy. You haven't, you are invested. And when you invest in somebody, well, yeah, it's a sacrifice of time and energy because you are going to start pouring into that person. And so I, I unfortunately see it so much now, Brandon, to where a lot of teachers don't speak life like they used to. Not to say that they're not still out there, because I know my kids have some pretty amazing teachers that, that love what they're doing. And I'm going to say the majority of the ones that still speak life and invest are the old school teachers, the ones that have been around for a long time, because those are the ones you know have... Um, They've done their time, right? They are they are in it for the long haul. They're not in it for the money. They're in it because they love it. And man, I we could probably talk a whole hour or longer just on teachers that have in it had an impact in our lives because much like myself, I had I had a coach. Um, it just reminds me of how George spoke life into you. Um, I was like, he I'm like, why is he always yelling at me? Right? Why is he always ride my tail and um and you i know you can appreciate that and <laughs> that resonates with you because you know you being a basketball coach you know what it's like to uh you have to ride the tail of a player at times because sometimes it, they just don't get it and they got to hear it from another person and they got to hear it sometimes it's tough love but he he told me he's like you know why i'm always he put his arm around my shoulder we were at a, a seventh and eighth grade i still remember man it's crazy uh, we were in the kind of like the commons area um, outside of the gym and we, it was a basketball tournament for seventh and eighth grade and uh, it was coach Davis and he put his arm around me and he's like Gilby and he's this big dude <laughs> big dude you know why I'm always giving you a hard time it's because I see the potential in you and he's like I'm not yelling at you and griping at you because I don't like you I see the potential and I want to push you to go to that potential. And so George saw potential in you. And George spoke life into you. And, and it resonated with you. You knew you had a hard situation with mom. And, you know, not having your earthly father in the picture. <clears throat> and I see so many kids these days, Brandon, that they don't have a father figure. And I often, and I don't want to be just, you know, saying that this is the case for everybody, but I have seen it in so many ways where if you see somebody that has trouble and I've seen it with some of the boys at school, you know, they're, they're causing problems and they're kind of bullying and they're just causing a lot of issues. And if you trace things back, a lot of times those, those boys don't have a father figure at home mm -hmm. and they don't have that guidance or that direction. Their mom might be working two or three jobs because she's a single mom. Right. And it's not trying, I'm not trying to stereotype anything, but, it happens. And a lot of the, these kids, the only way they know how to get attention is to cause problems. And I saw my boys yesterday, <clears throat> these boys that say things that are downgrading other people, putting other people down, it's because they're not happy themselves. And they have to put others <laughs> down to make them feel better. Because it's just like, I'm going to step on you as I uh, raise up to make myself feel better. But we both know that that doesn't make you feel better. That just, I mean, it's just, uh, a, it's a defense mechanism, really. Um, 
And, you know, I had a lot of people like that when I was growing up. It's like, why are they always picking on me? Well, I look back <clears throat> and one of the bullies that I dealt with always picking on me, always causing problems. He had a messed up home life and he yeah. didn't have enough people speaking life into him. And so I'm so thankful that George did as what a, what a man of God should do. Um, what a believer should do is to speak life into somebody. And so, man, words are so powerful. And so George speaks life into you and you move into a new home situation with your aunt and uncle and so thankful for aunts and uncles that are willing to open their home up. You know, once again, they, it could be considered an inconvenience because here they are opening up their home to their nephew opens up a whole new chapter because now they are responsible for you. And, uh, but I know that they loved you and that's why they did it. And so, yeah, just great stuff to, to know that the love of Christ was with you even through the hard times, like what we were talking about. Um, you know, the darkness, you were facing darkness. You move in with your, your aunt Debbie and your uncle Kevin. And I love Debbie as a name, by the way, because I have an aunt Debbie and, and Debbie's just rock. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can just picture mine. But they brought you in from a rocky situation and helped establish a foundation, like you said, a family foundation to where you truly knew what family was. And that helped to build who Brandon is today. And and for George to fall, kind of follow you along, right? It's almost like he was uh, an angel for you because it's like, you know, the Holy Spirit was leading you and you weren't alone. And, and God made a way to where you had this um, man who had spoke life into you to follow you on your path into high school. And then to think that he was your athletic director and here you are in basketball. So much changed, Brandon, because, I mean, that was such a pivotal time for you. Because as we both know, you go on to play in college and now you're a, a, a basketball coach at the same high school that you went to in Hallsville. It came full circle, brother, um, to see yeah. where you were this kid troubled in seventh and eighth grade. And George speaks life into you. And now you're in the position very similar to what George was, to where you are now in a leadership position, a coach, somebody in the community having the opportunity to speak life into young men. And, and I know you've had many opportunities, and this was just your first year as being the head coach. You've been an assistant coach for several years. What's it like for you, Brandon, um, to have that opportunity now? Because, I mean, it was, it was an answered prayer. I know that. But God opened up an opportunity for you to step into a head coaching position. And now you have this opportunity, this responsibility, because it is a responsibility and a calling um, to be a man of God and to lead by example. And I know we've had lots of conversations this last year about leading and man, should I do it this way or should I do it this way? And I don't know. And these boys aren't completely getting it. And you've watching these guys grow. Share a little bit about that, how, how God has molded you and shaped you in that position and, and what it's like to come full circle and, and to see that come to fruition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just going back to George, it was a divine appointment, absolutely, for him to be there that day. And, um, you know, all of those trials and stuff prior to that weren't wasted. They give me empathy for other kids going through similar things or things that are completely different that are challenges. And uh, so when I look at those kids that are going through that, you know, I don't see necessarily a kid that's just I, – I don't see bad kids. I just see – kids that are dealing with stuff and I you know that empathy for them makes me want to connect with them in a way that George did with me and um yeah so you know especially you know my first six years were coaching junior high um which I think the junior high level that's a that's an age where kids are still uh able to be influenced as far as their work ethic goes and the way they treat people you, you know they're still young and they're trying to find their way and it seems that that's the time where kids pick on kids and you know just trying to change the culture and the way kids treat each other our school's still somewhat small i think each 
grade level has about a hundred, 120 kids. Um, so, you know, if you can get the, the athletes in there and get them treating each other well first, and then, you know, bringing that to the hallways, that was, that was really something that was important to me. Um, but moving up to the high school level, it was, uh, it was, you know, definitely at first though, I just, you know, remember feeling somewhat inadequate, not prepared, didn't want to mess up. Whatever I do, I want to do, I want to do well. And uh, so definitely I started to study a lot and everything. But at the end of the day, like X's and O's will come. I And we had a good year. Like you said, we, we had a really good year. Um, but it's really not about wins and losses. When we were 14 and 10, we got second place in our district. We made uh, a couple tournament finals. Um, we didn't win any. We got a couple second place uh, finishes in some tournaments. And uh, but yeah, it, it, for me, it's about it's about mentoring the young men. And you know, the I just remember there was some times. You know, one time this year, we had a kid that uh, played football and uh, came came to play basketball. I'd known him since he was in seventh grade and. You know, actually, when our other head coach left, a lot of the players that had previously quit came back. And I think a lot of that was due to the relationship we had when they were in junior high. Um, we had four seniors that didn't play uh, until I was brought in to be the head coach, and now they're coming back. So I felt really good about that because it made me feel like they believed in me and they wanted to be a part of the team. Um, but, I, you know, one of the kids that, that came back, um, he's a great football player, and uh, it was. I remember he he quit not because he, we were having issues or anything, but I think the kid just plays all year round. He needed some time off, and he needed sure. a break. And when he did, you know, it was an emotional time for him and for me because I remember, you know, thinking, you know, man, I've known this young man since he was in seventh grade, and. I'm not going to have the opportunity to be with him, you know, for four months out of the year, six days a week anymore. And uh, so it was emotional for him and it was emotional for me. And we met in my office and he gave me a hug and I hugged him. And, you know, I went back out to talk to the team about it, to let them know that, that he was going to be taking, taking that time off this season. And um, I remember getting emotional when I was talking to the kids on the team, you know, they're sitting there and they're, and they're stretching and I'm choked up talking to them. And uh, I remember after that, you know, like I actually told him, I said, I'll be, I'll be back. Like I had to walk out of the gym because it was, it was really emotional for me. And uh, when I came back in, all the kids were like, man, I've never seen coach cry before. And, uh, you know, but that, that just like those relationships matter to me. When I came back in, one of the kids they're all kind of quiet. And then one of the kids walked up to me and just like from behind, picked me up, gave me a hug. Next thing you know, everybody on the team is like giving me this big old group hug. And uh, they know I love them. They know I love them. And I believe that they love me too. And I, it's, I tell them I, I love them. Not in a weird way. It's like, look, man, I love y'all too much to let practice be going this way, you know, but I feel like, my primary focus in coaching is building relationships with young men so that they can trust me and know that I'm for them, not against them. And uh, I believe that they all know it. But, uh, so it's a lot more, I mean, yeah, we want to continue to build on a good year and we want to have a great basketball tradition. This, you know, basketball has always been my thing and in Hallsville, that's always kind of what I've been known for is being a, a good basketball player uh, that came from Hallsville. But for me, it was about school. It's about it's about the the difference I can make in their lives that uh, will have eternal significance, not wins and losses. But uh, I think we're off to a good start for sure. Yeah, I think one of the things I think about when we've talked, um, and you know, you've been you've been with the program for many years, and so you've established, you know, relationship. They they know who you are. They you know, it's all about character, right? They've seen how Brandon acts. They know what you're about. And it's just, you know, they know that you're going to be there for them because you've stuck with them since they've been in junior high, just like George was for you. 
Uh, here you are, you know, getting emotional, giving a, you know, a player giving you a hug, just like George and you giving a hug. And it's like, you know, it's awesome to see that there's that relationship. Um, and it's about culture is, you know, it resonates. And it's so important is sometimes, just like you said, you've got players that, that did not want to play anymore for the coach. And it's not to talk bad about the coach, but, you know, there was probably some things that he didn't do that was the best for the program. And, you know, just like we both have experienced in the corporate um, world, sometimes you get a boss or leadership that you don't see eye to eye with and they don't, they're not the best person for the job. Um, and so there's no growth, right? It's, it's a challenge. It's, it's, it's like, okay, but now he leaves. They see that there's a shifting and okay, Brandon's now in, in at the helm. We want to come back. And it, it's cool to see that they want to come back and they wanted to, you know, finish their careers playing under the leadership of somebody that they respect. It's, I think it's, it's totally something that's respect because if they didn't respect you, they wouldn't have come back. Um, it would have been just like, Oh, here we are with another coach, brand new coach. I don't want to deal with this, but you know, it's much like uh, my boys is soccer coach. You know, he, he talks about, you know, it's, it's not about the wins and losses. Yes. I want to win, but I want to build relationship and foundation for these men and these young men growing into men for their life to prepare them for life because sports isn't going to last forever. They're not going to always be <clears throat> playing basketball or, or playing soccer or whatever sport it might be. Not to say that that won't have an influence in life going forward and they might not play it, but they might be a part of it. But the foundations and the principles that you're teaching and coaching, those will stick with them the rest of their lives. And so here it is a huge responsibility. Um, and like I said, a calling for you to do this. So cool to see. Uh, it's It was just exciting. I know when, when you told me that you were going to be the coach and you had more than one opportunity pop up too which is even cooler because you know you had another school offer you the position even before um this one panned out but you stuck with this one and, and i'm i think it was the best thing for you because um just going back to the school where you went i mean it's kind of that special connection right going back to sticking with hallsville and you know we're going to do the it's we're going to do it the indian way right and um yeah you you guys had a, a pretty good season. Um, was it ideal? Not necessarily as far as wins and losses go. You guys won some great games. You lost some games that you should have won. And as coaches, that's that's uh, frustrating. And I know you got frustrated, but it was a lesson that you guys learned and you guys uh, manned up and, and pushed through and made a nice run into regionals. And, you know, you went a lot further in the postseason than I know you were thinking you were going to go. And those boys finally started to click. And I know you guys had adversity early going too. And much like this last year for all of us is, you know, you guys were, you, you built a, a foundation with those boys, Brandon, is you're going out there and doing the hard work with them. Now, a lot of coaches in my past is they want you to do the hard work and then you're basically not doing it right. But you led by example. And when I say that is, you know, as Brandon, he's an ultra runner. And Brandon likes to run miles. <laughs> and what do I see? Brandon is out getting his boys to run um, this last summer and into the fall um, and into the season. And you're out having these guys do six to eight miles training runs. And I was like, dude, my coach never had us run like that. We just basically ran wind sprints and suicides and stuff like that in the gym. But these boys are actually running, um, you know, training distance wise with you and, not only just as a coach saying, okay, go run, go run your mileage. No, Brandon's out there running with them as a leader. And so that builds huge amounts of trust because you're in the trenches with them and they respect you for it. But, yeah. and I think it's the bond and the closeness that you guys had to help you through adversity because, you know, you were entering your first year of basketball and here we are coming in to 2021, 2020, 2021 with the pandemic still raging, not sure what's going to happen. Most schools weren't even having sports like 
especially like basketball, we weren't, you weren't sure what was going to happen. And then your season did get interrupted with COVID. You had some players test positive and um, you ended up catching um, the Rona and had to quarantine yeah. and you start this season and it was great. And then your season gets interrupted and it's like, you're having this great progress and then you had to hit the pause button. Yeah. And it's right at the Christmas time. And so then you guys had to start right almost starting from scratch, start back over and then ramp back up. So you guys conquered adversity in a, in a major way because, I mean, to interrupt a season, to stop, pause and start back up, that's huge because that momentum yeah. stopped. But then you guys picked it right back up and, and got right back into it. And so, I mean, that speaks volumes on the um, – what you guys had built and established that momentum never, never completely stopped. And you guys were able to push through. And so that talks so much about adversity um, as an ultra runner. And as a coach, Brandon, um, what do you feel? Maybe not. What do you feel, but what is the most important aspect of it for you as a believer? How does having a relationship with God and with Christ, how does that help lead you Um because, I mean, yeah, God helps us. God gives us strength and, and gives us focus and direction. But what's what's one of the most important pieces as as a believer for you in those situations to help you, you know, right the ship? You know, you, you know that the waters are rocky. How does it help you persevere and know that, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be tough for a little while, but we're going to push through this. Yeah, um, to, your, to your point, yeah. Um... Yeah, we were six and two when we got the the COVID. Nine of our varsity players tested positive. Not everybody took the test, um, but nine tested positive. So we had a, a big quarantine, and uh, we had just beat a team that our school hadn't beaten six years. It's a team we play twice a year. So over the past five years, we were zero and twelve against them, or maybe one and twelve over this period. Um, we just beat them, which was a huge win for us. Six and two. Um, we get the, we get the coronavirus. We actually show up for another tournament where we, I think we, we had a great chance to win that tournament. We're warming up and we get a phone call as our kids are on the floor warming up. One of our kids missed school that day and he had tested. He was the first one to take the test and we got to call that he had tested positive. So we, uh, we had to leave the floor in the middle of warmups, get on the bus and go home. And so we just, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a challenge. Uh, and it just kind of like tested, tested my leadership, you know, you know, these kids are all down about this. Nobody wants to go home. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, but to your question about, you know, leadership and, and, uh, as a Christian and how do you, how do you kind of navigate the waters? You know, like I said earlier, it, when I, when I was feeling inadequate before our first game, I don't know if I told you this or not, if I shared this with you, I think I did. But I remember on, a, on my way to school before the first game, it was my first game as a head coach. I was praying uh, in the truck on the way to school. Uh, just, you know, one of them little prayers. My eyes are open. I'm, I'm watching the street, but I'm praying. And, uh, you know, God, like, help me. These kids deserve somebody that is everything that, that, they, that they need to have. Like, you know, I – I don't want to be anything less than everything they need. Like help me lead them and guide them in sport and in, in every aspect of life. And uh, so I go into my office, sit down. Every, the kids are in the gym shooting. We're getting ready to get on the bus. And I open up my Bible. Did I tell you this story? Well, I don't remember the exact verse, but I turned it to a page that I had not been on uh, before. You know, and uh, I have not read two Chronicles before, but I believe I, I want to I don't want to say the verse wrong, but I think it was like two Chronicles 15 ish. And the verse was. Bear in mind what I just prayed. The verse was. Because you're basically the desire of your heart is not for uh, wealth or riches or glory, but it's to lead God's people knowledge will be given to you like it, 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 we, i don't know if you can get it. i can't get it up on my phone but 
it was too CrossFit, but that, that was like, God telling me like, I got you. I'm with you. I'm for you. Well, cast your anxiety on me. You are enough with me alone. I wouldn't be enough, but that at that moment I knew, you know, everything was going to be okay. And, uh, so we ended up going out and we were playing against a team who had a new head coach, but he was a hall of fame head coach. He's been in coaching for 30 years and, uh, it was his first game with his new school and um, we ended up winning the game by 50 points and uh, it, we weren't trying to run up the score. This was a team we beat by one the year prior and our kids just played great. And I was like, all right, God, you got this, man. No matter what happens this year, we are right where we're supposed to be. And um, yeah, I mean, so, so my confidence was, Hey, whatever happens this year. And I tell the kids, you know, through this adversity, we're right where we're supposed to be. Like, um, every loss was a lesson that prepared us to go further into districts than our school has gone, uh, in 30 years, you know, we'd made it this far, uh, over that 30 year period, but we hadn't made it further than we made it in 30 years. So, you know, we were 14 and 10 to finish out the year, but uh, it all came together and we had a chance to win the district final at uh, the end of the year, which would have been our first district championship in 30 years. So just the fact that we made it there was great. And uh, yeah. You hadn't told me that story, but I do remember you talking about the Hall of Fame coach and you guys went into that game and, you know, I think of like David and Goliath, right? Because you got this Hall of Fame coach who's had a, a very successful career, right? And you're going into this as a first-year coach. The odds don't look like they would be in your favor because, you know, Hall of Fame coach is going to know how to get his guys fired up. Now, granted, he was on a new team as well. and But still, mm -hmm. experience in basketball as, as a seasoned coach – in most instances that coach is going to be able to pull some cards out of his hat that you're not prepared for because you know, yeah, you're, you're a rookie coach, but you're not a rookie. You're not a rookie in the game itself. And as we both know, you know, X's and O's um, it's ingrained in you and, and you were prepared, even though you weren't a, um, a seasoned coach, like he was um, you're, you're not new to the game. And, you know, X's and O's, when, when players go to play, they know what to do. And as long as you know the game and you were prepared, which you were because you had the Lord at the center of all of it, um, he led you um, into battle. And, man, you just basically turn it over and let them go. And those boys, yeah, you had some talented young men. And uh, players are going to play. And I, I know both of us have seen some amazing games in our lifetime to where you got players that are – going off for crazy numbers, crazy. Um, it's like, man, that dude just dropped 50 points. What the heck, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, and I know towards the end of the season, you guys had just a phenomenal defensive um, mindset. And, and, you know, as they always say, defense wins championships. And it's like that for any sport, really, because ultimately you got to score more points than the other team. That's the, that's the name of the game for any sport. But if the defense is on top and you keep them from scoring, you're you're yeah. gonna have success. And and I know I watched a few of the games this last year, thankful for for technology like this, to where, you know, here I can watch you pace in the sideline and there's there's my boy Brandon. And uh he's he's getting all worked up and he's ready to go. And um it was fun to be able to watch games, Brandon, and then talk to you after the game and say, Hey, you know, this is what I saw, and you're like, Yeah, I know. And I, mm -hmm. I just to see adversity, um, you know, yeah, I love the game. Um, but to see it with my friend and be able to talk about it um, and have you talk to me as a coach and, you know, I'm, I'm sharing as a coach is from, yeah, I've coached some basketball um, might not be as good of a coach as you, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, to see one game, I remember, I don't remember who it was that you guys were playing, but you guys were up pretty big at halftime. I was like, oh man, they got this one made. And I had to go and do some stuff. And I came back in the, in the third quarter and you guys were down. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> Complete yeah. collapse. And I was like, what? And the guys ended up losing at the buzzer on that game. 
um, yeah. came down and they hit a three pointer at the buzzer and, and beat you guys. And I was like, no, that's, that's a game that you guys should have won. And that's that the thing. Big. Yeah. You know, you got to stay engaged four quarters or two halves. And here you guys have this huge lead and I know how it is. And you know how it is as a player, you get confident and you get pride and yeah. you think we've got this made. And then you let off the gas a little bit and that other team warmed up and started getting some momentum and some confidence and they made a run and made another run. And then they ran you out the gym. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, that was the thing where we were up by 16 points um, in the third quarter at one point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they ended up, a kid that averaged eight points a game ended up having 30 points and he had 20 points in the fourth quarter. And our best player was guarding him when he hit the, the buzzer beater at the end of the game, like contested. And, um, you know, we were in the middle of a hot streak when that happened. And, uh, you know, I told the kids, like, we can, we can let this be a lesson or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not going to yell about this. I was like, you all are upset that we lost. You know, I'm not happy that we lost, but let's turn this loss into a lesson. And the lesson was when you're up by 16, it's not time to, you know, try to go pad your stats. It's time to like continue to play basketball as a team, the way that we play it whenever games are tight and uh, gave them a little bit of life. And they shot 50% from three that game and made a ton of threes and, you know, but it's a lesson and it's a lesson that served us well moving forward that helped us in our district run, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think that coaches um, and parents have an opportunity in situations like that to let it be a lesson and, and, and just don't get, I'm not going to yell at you about it, but we're going to evaluate what just happened and uh, learn from it moving forward. You know, Absolutely. as much as I hate losing and I know you do too, it's, it's important to, to taste defeat um, like that because um, you get these teams like in the NCAA where they've, you know, like this last year, Gonzaga, you know, everyone swore that they were going to win the national championship, right? They're 30 and 0. Um, they hadn't lost a game. And I've seen it so many times where teams are undefeated through the whole season. They get in the tournament and they lay an egg. Um, or, you know, or they get to their conference tournament, here they are undefeated, and they lose in the first round of the conference tournament. I was like, that's exactly what they needed because then that team tastes a little adversity, and, and it, it gets you fired up, right, because you don't like to lose. But if you lose in the first round of your conference tournament, then you know what you need to do, and you fix it, and you make a mad mad run in, in, the, in, the, you know, in the tournament. You guys have this game where you're up by 16, and then you get beat at the buzzer, which is – Nobody likes to lose, but man, to lose at the buzzer like that, those crush you. Those can, and it's just like the words that you choose. You know, you choose the right words or choose the wrong words, it'll lead you in the path. So that was an opportunity for you to lead these guys. Okay, guys, we lost. I'm not mad at you. I'm not going to yell at you. Just learn from it. It's an opportunity to learn from it and move on. And, um, you know, they faced the adversity and it, and it helped you guys going forward into your run into districts and into regionals um, was important because I, I remember after that, you guys started to click and, and things started to click finally and they started playing more as a team and you had some crazy stats that were going down and the defense was, was just doing what they needed to do. And you guys were hitting three pointers and it's like, yeah, you guys were making some serious runs and just like in ultra marathons. Um, with DNFs, it's like, you know, just because you did not finish does not mean you don't learn a lesson. And I know with mine, you know, those first two, I didn't, I didn't finish, but I learned so much. And you take those opportunities as learning opportunities um, to do better and, and to figure out what needs to change. And just like in our walk, Brandon, is some things needed to change in your life at a, at a young age. And you had an outside source come in and, and give you some advice and I mean, he couldn't do it for you. George couldn't do it for you. And George spoke some words into you, and he said, "I, I he believed in you, but he said you, I, you, you can go to the left or you can go to the right, and you make make a good decision or a bad decision." But he, the important thing is, he said, "I believe you're going to make the right decision." But then it was on you. It was up to Brandon to make that decision, and thankfully, um, you did because uh, you know it's it's been great. But you know, we're we're given opportunities and things in life. 
where we don't always make the right decisions and there are consequences for our decisions and choices. Um, but as we both know with, with God, that um, his grace is sufficient for us and we are forgiven, but there are consequences and you just got to make the wise, wise decisions and, and good choices. And so, man, time flies, brother. Um, it always does. I know we could, we could talk for hours cause I know we have when we've ran and yeah. um, I love those conversations. Um, I am going to do my best to see about coming up to run that 50 K with you. I may completely put myself um, out of commission running wise for a while. Um, but the opportunities to spend time with you as my brother, um, I, I think is important that fellowship and that relationship. And so guys stay tuned for those that are listening or watching. I'm probably going to be putting myself through some pain and misery. Um, but as brothers, we'll do things for each other. And uh, just to have the opportunity to come and, and spend time with you is priceless. And uh, that's that's what I look forward to. But, man, Brandon, um, I appreciate you joining me this morning and just sharing a little bit about your heart and what you've gone through as a player and as a coach and as a man. And, man, I, I know we could talk for hours. But uh, we've got uh, responsibilities. Speaking of men and as fathers, we got to get our kids ready for school. And have to get ready for the day for our jobs, our J-O-B. And, um, but, uh, man, I enjoyed having some coffee with you and just chatting about, um, about stuff this morning. And appreciate you joining me, bro. Absolutely, man. Let's do it again sometime. It's good Absolutely. to see you. Next time, it, we, we won't be doing a podcast. Talk. We'll just be talking and chilling and having some yeah. coffee. So, right. But um, Brandon Kreitz um, from Missouri blessed man of God and appreciate you being on with me, man. And, uh, have a great day and we will talk to you soon, my friend. You too, brother. Thanks. All right. Take care, brother.